Thank you for the introduction. Um, this is embarrassing. I need to fix my screen. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, that fixed. Yes, okay, computer scientists are excellent at, at uh, technology. Okay, so um, this is a panel with, uh, so I am the least renowned person on this stage. Um, so I'm going to introduce our lovely panelists and then I'll explain what we're doing here. Um, so to my right is Julia Angwin, who is an awesome investigative uh, journalist at ProPublica, which is a nonprofit investigative journalism um, organization. She has written a book about surveillance called Dragnet Nation. Um, she used to be at the Wall Street Journal where she led a privacy investigative team. So she is awesome and super great. Um, to <laughs> Uh, next, we have Jack Gillum, who is an investigative reporter at the AP, the Associated Press, um, and he focuses on technology and surveillance and government accountability. Um, he spent the last year uncovering a U.S. government plan to overthrow Cuba using fake social media, so you may have heard about this story. Um, and to... And I think our last panelist needs no introduction here, um, but I'll do so anyway. Laura Poitras is a documentary filmmaker, a Pulitzer Prize winner, a Polk Award winner, an Oscar nominee for Citizen Four, the film that we'll be showing right after this. And my role here, as it was explained, I live in the ivory tower and I pontificate about cryptography. So that will be my role here, is to be the ivory tower um, cryptographer. <laughs> So the, the genesis of this panel was, I, for some reason, was at a bar a few months ago with Julia, and um, it, we sort of introduced ourselves, and she's like, I hate cryptographers. And I was like, why? We're so harmless. And I mean, her explanation was basically that every time she talks to a cryptographer, they sound like this. Some long-winded story about Alice and Bob that has no relationship to reality. Um, and. So, um, and she started telling stories, and I thought these stories were amazing, and, and also they sort of changed my idea of how sort of cryptography related to how journalists actually practice. So, um, we decided to organize something where we could have a conversation with the community about um, how cryptography and journalism interact. And this is sort of, you can think of this as QA testing um, for you guys, that you have a bunch of, um, sort of QA testers who have done some things and they have some feedback for you. And maybe we can have a conversation, you can um, suggest some ideas for um, what they could be doing to secure themselves better and they can give you some ideas of problems that they have that are not being solved. So, that said, okay, let's, uh, let's do this. All right, so if you are thinking about journalists from the perspective of um, a, say, cryptography, practitioner or like a, a security professional, you think, okay, what, are, what is the task that a journalist is trying to accomplish? They, they need to communicate confidentially with their sources. Confidentially meaning like some eavesdropper can't view the conversation that they're having. All right, step number one, Alice and Bob install some crypto software. And I, I think the thing that we're trying to get at here is that you know, Laura and, and, and Glenn had really an amazing source in Edward Snowden. I mean, just a, a, a hang in the moon gold mine of a source, really great documents, really uncovered a lot of, of, of government, you know, malfeasance. But maybe this is boring sounding and covering the federal bureaucracy that is Washington. But most of the time, it's a guy named Bob who's like five years away from retirement and just can't fucking take it anymore. And he wants to find a way to get you a document like you know, a two-page PDF that he barely knows how to print on the local printer that he needs help from an assistant uh, photocopying. And it's that sort of, uh, you know, OPSEC involved there because if he keeps printing out these documents, he's the same Bob who logs in from his work computer and goes, you hear that you've got mail because he still uses AOL 15 years later. Like, the, those are the people that we deal with on a regular basis. And and it's the little breadcrumbs that they, 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 they want to impart to you. 
And so when you, I guess what we're, we're going to start getting at is that when you then sit down and go, okay, so you're going to need to install GPG tools. If you use Windows, Cleopatra, you're going to need to do a rev revocation key. Like the minute they heard install revocation key, they're like, I, no, um, we're done. I mean, and that's, and that's happened before. And, and then they take the easy way out and then that can lead to trouble, I think. Right, and unfortunately, oops. unfortunately, the easy way out is that they are unsafe, right? And yes. so they, so one of the pro challenges for journalists is that we are, are trying to keep our sources from making mistakes that will then hurt them. And also hurt us, but more them often. And so, um, you know, all the time people send me things from their Gmail account at work, on their work computer, thinking somehow that was some secret transmission and that their bosses will never find out. And um, and it's just um, unfortunate. So the thing is, what, we're, what we want to talk about is sort of how the bar is so much lower than you guys <laughs> maybe understand in terms of like what we're dealing with. And Edward Snowden obviously was like this perfect source who came fully encrypted. And I have yet to meet a source like that. <laughs> I'm waiting. So one of the things I remember hearing about is that often sources don't even realize that they're sources. Right. So this is, um, this is one of the things, this first date problem that um, Nadia and I were talking about at the bar was that, you know, you meet somebody in the course of your reporting and you're like, hey, let's get a drink. And maybe you even met them through writing something very innocuous. And then you're at a bar and you're like, so like, what do you think about setting up an encrypted channel? <laughs> and they're like, what? And it's a little bit like asking for sex on the first date. <laughs> you know, it's a little too much too soon. <laughs> So, so I was telling Nadia this, and that actually was probably the genesis for this panel, was that line. Um, so, and I've done this, right, and I've tried to convince people, and it, they're like, this is, I don't even actually know what you're talking about. <laughs> Sometimes it's successful, and you never know. But, um, but a lot of times, it's, um, it's really a psychological problem. This person is thinking like they might help you because they want to make sure the story is correct or they just sort of want to provide you one fact, but they don't want to be thought of in their own mind as a source. I mean, I, I'd like to just say a couple things sort of from the journalist perspective or sort of our kind of progression of actually how we learn these tools. And um, so I went through, um, a period where, so I, I made a film in, in Iraq and then I was put on a, on, a, on a watch list. So I knew that I had to sort of be careful, but I didn't really know what that meant. And so the film that I made after that I made in, in Yemen and it was dealt, in Yemen and in Guantanamo. And I knew that like digital communication was not safe. So I was like sort of danger zone. Um, and, but I didn't know quite actually how to, to, to respond to that or how to sort of work around that. And, and I was, um, trying to get access at that point. I, I was trying to get access to get a film crew in, to Guantanamo and to film. And I had gone through like the official channels. I went and tried the front door and I, and I just never got anywhere. I just sort of like delayed, delayed, delay. And then my name was on all the requests and that wasn't going anywhere. And then I was like, all right, I need to try the side door, you know, like, like how can I get to Guantanamo through the side door, which was, you know, created like this sort of, you know, efforts to kind of like sever metadata, like to have the person, like I hired somebody to sort of be the person who sent in the letters and they called from their cell phone and not never from my office and did these kind of things to kind of, you know, not have a direct, you know, connection to, between me and these requests that were going in. And for, for that whole film, I really kind of almost resorted to like an analog way of working. Like I, I was sending grant applications, but I would never send any over email. I was like, everyone got a hard copy and these kinds of things. And it wasn't actually until, um, uh, working on, on this, the film that I'm going to show. So later that I actually learned some tools. And it wasn't that easy to actually find out what were the correct tools because like you, you know, you do a search and like a lot of things come back in terms of what um, is recommended. So it, it actually took quite a long time where I was working kind of in the dark, not knowing what tools I could trust to have anonymity and, and um, security and, and to do the work that, that I was doing. And then, you know, luckily I, I had some very good teachers. <laughs> So what does work? 
stresses. Say it again. Is there anything that does work? Anything that doesn't work? Does. 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 That does work. I, 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 how do you mean? <laughs> like, um, I mean, Jake, um, Jake Applebaum and I are doing um, uh, a talk tomorrow, and we'll talk about some things in terms of that, that work. So. So there's one last problem that I remember uh, discussing about the difficulties of installing crypto software, which is that if you were at a bar, imagine you're at a bar, and you pull out your phones, you're installing the software. Right, so one time I did manage to get someone convinced to do this on the first date <laughs> at a bar, and um, I thought that an encrypted um, messaging app would probably be the easiest thing. You know, a cell phone app, this is... Um, it was silent uh, text at the time. And so I sat down with my source and I was like, this is going to be so much fun. We're just, just, just like fun, you know, be like a fun way to just, just communicate. And so, um, so, you know, it's one of those things where sort of it takes a long time to download and then you, there's a lot of verification actually that ha you have to do. So um, there was a verification key that like we had to exchange with each other and for some unknown reason we just took an hour to do this and by the end of it we were both sort of like covered in sweat and exhausted and like it was a little like sex on the first date and we were um, <laughs> and you know the thing is that um silent circle we were using it, it was really the early days it had just come out because there wasn't that much crypto that I felt like I couldn't ask this person to try to use GPG so um so we had these calls um, that it was like the 70s, you know, where like I would talk and then there'd be like a five second delay and then <laughs> she would reply. And um, I realized, you know, that it was too painful and we both kind of gave up using it after um, several months. And so, uh, but we gave it a really good try and but it, it's just sitting at a bar trying to do this when you've had two glasses of wine is, um, we probably weren't, you know, at our best for these tools. Okay, so once uh, Alice and Bob have successfully installed some crypto software, the next thing they do is exchange keys. This is, you know, one of the great things in um, the, the greatest developments in cryptography ever, public key cryptography. You exchange keys. It solves the key management problem. And unfortunately, the reality of the key management problem today even still looks like this. So, so my family, like, including a, a relatively renamed nameless, um, likes to use, you know, the different search engines out there that are installed on, on our browser, like Bing. You know, Jack, have you, have you Binged this today? And I have no idea what she's saying. When, and these are the people who we are dealing with in Washington who, like, have this rudimentary understanding and have their kids fix their iPhone. Or, you know, you know, even younger people don't really understand this. So when you, you know, say the words open up terminal or open up the command line in Windows, again, like we were saying earlier, I mean, that's when they sort of freeze. And, and part of this is, and maybe, and maybe some of the audience can correct me if I'm wrong, but in Windows, you know, which I have to use for my work, Cleopatra, you can't out of the GUI create a revocation key. So at least that I haven't been able to find. And, so you, and that's obviously a very critical part if your laptop gets stolen or compromised or whatever, you need that revocation key. And just even explaining it to very smart you know, almost tech savvy coworkers are like, well, wait, what? It needs two hyphens with the out, with the revoke. And, and it's, it's just that, that, that complicated message. You know, for us, you know, it's maybe not that hard to just fire up the terminal and type a command and bash and, and be done with it. But it's, it's that critical step that people tend to bypass. I think we're going to talk about the shortcuts that people take too when these things get hard beyond what they're, what they're used to. And not to paint our industry that, you know, a lot of journalists are, or dunder buses or something, but you know we're set in our ways. I mean, we're, we're, we we spend you know 10, 20, 30 years. We know how to report a story, how to turn the screws on people, how to get the documents, how to file the public records request, and we're sort of been doing that chumming, you know chugging along for a long time. And all of a sudden, you know, and you know, and particularly after the Snowden disclosures made us realize more than anything. And after you know, my colleagues at the AP to boot, where their phone records were subpoenaed by the Justice Department. I mean. Sometimes they really are out to get you, and and you, you you know this is this is this is critically serious. So it's it's I think trying to teach an old and young dog new tricks, and, and it's very difficult. I think. Also, I just want to confess, I don't have 
a revocation key, I'm sorry, <laughs> or a separate sub key. I've been meaning to, <laughs> um, but honestly, I find it kind of challenging. I've taken me two years, three years of like really working at using GPG, and I feel like I kind of have my little system duct taped together. And so, um, and lest you think less of me, which I'm sure you do, I um, am probably the most tech savvy journalist in every newsroom I've been in. I grew up in Silicon Valley. I started programming in basic in fifth grade. I do actually have some credentials, but I find this stuff incredibly challenging. Just one question. How many people in this room understand everything that's on the screen right now? Everybody. Yes. <laughs> we need more sources like you. <laughs> Seriously. How many of you guys understand everything that's on the screen right now? I, I, I'm the guy who went to the, 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 the Linux users groups parties growing up and had no friends, so I understand this a little bit, but I loved it. I'm not, I wouldn't change it for the world. But. I, I'll, 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 I think I understand it. Um, that doesn't mean I succeed. Uh, okay, so once uh, Alice and Bob have exchanged public keys, they need to verify the authenticity of these keys, so they, uh, Alice and Bob need to verify fingerprints. Laura, you should tell like the best case scenario, right? Yeah, um, I don't know how many people, um, Micah Lee, who uh, works with me at The Intercept, wrote um, a lengthy piece about how he helped um, my initial contact with, with Snowden. And um, what had happened was um, uh, Snowden had tried for a while to get Glenn um, on encryption that didn't work. And then actually the way that Snowden found me is he emailed the Freedom of the Press Foundation, which is an organization that I'm on the board of, and um, trying to get in touch with me and get my key. And I think also wanting to somewhat verify that the key that he got was um, uh, was correct. And so then Micah sent me an email, an encrypted email, and said, hey, some guy, or some person who didn't know the gender, um, wants to get in touch with you. Can I give your key? And I said, sure. And then um, he then emailed, and we did a first exchange. His first email to me was to my true name account. It was at Gmail. Um, maybe I, I didn't think I said that before, but it was. Um, and uh, uh, he then actually, but that email has already been published. His email that he sent it to. So then, so then he said something that was like certainly um, got my attention, uh, which I think was in that he was in the government and that he wanted to share information, and that no matter what happened to him, the information should make its way to the American public. And so that certainly got my attention. Um, uh, so then he asked me to create a new um, account, an anonymous account and to contact him. Um, he sent me uh, a fresh, um, he, sent, he, he contacted me at a new email address with a fresh key, asked for one, and then he asked me to, to figure out a way to, um, to verify it, and he gave me some options, and one of them was to have someone tweet it. And so he, he actually recommended that Micah tweet the fingerprint. So then I emailed the fingerprint to Micah and I said, I said, hey, you know, I didn't say too much about the, you know, the first email. I just said, you know, would you mind just, you know, putting this in your Twitter account? And, uh, and he did. And uh, so that was how Snowden was able to verify um, my fingerprint. Um, and that was, you know, like a couple, probably a week or two weeks after we started corresponding. And then we were sort of on an anonymous you know, both you know, my communications were were um, severed from my true name, but I was still using the same computer. And then the next email that I got after that one was the sort of holy shit email, which is when I realized that I really need to create sort of a real blockade between anything that was tied to my true identity and these communications. And that's when um, uh, that, I, that I moved over to Tails, to the Tails operating system. So thank you. If there are any Tails developers in the room, thank you. Um, should, should I, I can continue on a little bit in the story and then we can come back. So, um, so then I, so he actually Snowden had said, you know, for most security, you should use Tails. And I, 
I'd, um, I'd, I'd known of it, um, but I wasn't using it at that time. And so, um, but I did have a bit of a dilemma with it because I didn't really have confidence of how to verify this, the download, the certificate. And uh, and I actually was back in Berlin, and I, I was a friend of a friend. One one of the friends is in the in the room gave me the name of another person whose last name I actually never knew, um, who set up a Tails um, disk for me on a computer, which was a computer that um, I purchased with cash um, in New York. So it was, there was nothing tied to my, my name in, in the correspondence um, from then on. So that's like above and beyond levels of verification and, and trust verification. <laughs> And then you can, I'm just, I guess I'm going to play the part of like the, <laughs> the complete hapless one here, but I did the, I thought one of my sources, I thought um, key verification in terms of numbers would be too hard, so we tried to do the shared secret on OTR. I managed to get this person on OTR, and, um, and I thought that it would be really easy if we, we didn't set up a shared secret in advance. I just thought we would be able to come up with one. So I said, when did we first meet? And then... Or where? Where did we first meet? What location? And the person answered wrong. And then that person answered, asked me a question of where we first met. And I answered it wrong. Turns out we had no idea where we had first met. <laughs> and, um, so that didn't work. <laughs> How many people in this room have had that problem? I feel, I feel better. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now we've, we've successfully verified the authenticity of our keys and our software. Um, step number four in uh, confidential communication is Alice and Bob actually initiate confidential communication with each other. <laughs> yeah. You all understand why this entire talk is, is illustrated with XKCD slides. <laughs> And, and even, even at the AP, depending on which version of software you install, it either does inline PGP, it attaches it as an, well, an attachment, or, and, and you can't read them, and there's UTF to ASCII character conversions, and that's just among four people I work with. And that's, you know, I, it's, it's, you know, yet another headache, I think. We're not bagging on this entirely. I mean, there, there, I mean, this, the, the story, the Cuba story that, um, that Nadia was mentioning, we used PGP extensively when we did work in, Countries that, shall we say, aren't really very favorable toward the press. Um, we used other tools, which I'm sure Laura's going to talk about um, in the future. Uh, a communi secure voice communication tools like Whisper Systems, the Signal. We use that um, quite a bit, uh, and it worked very well. Um, and other sort of tools. So, so don't take away the impression that this is all garbage and we're throwing up our hands. It's just that <laughs> your mileage may vary. <laughs> Right. I mean, I guess I could just bring in like yet another <laughs> sad story. So um, one time I was really proud because I was really getting like a good PGP communication going with um, somebody. And then all of a sudden we started dropping plain text. And basically it turned out that one of us had it set only to accept Okay, I'm going to get the technology wrong. S mime and PGP, and one of us was not accepting P S mime, and so, um, so the whole thing fell apart. And um, once again, I just felt like every time I think I've climbed like some way up the mountain, it turns out I'm really just at base camp. <laughs> I will confess that um, I have dropped plain text with people on this stage. <laughs> um, and uh, let's see. So, okay, um, I guess, let's see, we can, we can talk about, once, once, once we've moved on from confidentiality, um, we've, we've talked about this a little bit already of um, another property that journalists need with uh, sources is anonymous communication. Laura was talking about anonymous, unlinkable communication. So um, what this 
looks like is, um, say, the, the simplest case, uh, even not using so much cryptography um, is, if you want an unlinkable thing, this is what Laura just did. She purchased a device with cache um, and then installed software on it. So um, Alice, our journalist, uh, might per purchase a burner phone with cache, uh, maybe install some encrypted communication applications on it, install all the contacts so that they've been verified by her, um, and then, say, mail Bob his special burner phone, and then Bob can use his burner phone to securely communicate with Alice. This is, this is straightforward. This is taking all of the responsibility for installation and verification away from Bob, our hapless source. Um, so how does this work in practice? Yeah, so um, <laughs> colleagues of mine actually think that this is a, a true burner phone. Um, I, it's, it's not. Um, it's tied, particularly when they do it on their phone, they tie it to their Apple ID and then make what they think are anonymous phone calls. Um, this was sort of by accident, not he put the slide in, because uh, the one use the burner actually as an aside burner um, had was, it, it, it's an, an, obviously it's an app, where you can select an area code and for a certain amount of credits create a, a phone number that you know, masks or aid, masquerades from that, that area code. Or, well, not masquerades, and they can call, call you back on it. And I remember once dealing with a, a former Washington official, who we got a, a document how he's got some big uh, payout from an organization, and he wouldn't obviously pick up my 202, that's a, a Washington DC area code phone number, uh, wouldn't pick up a block number, wouldn't do it. So I, I figured out where he lived in a rural, in his rural state where he retired to, and I got that, that area code and called him up, and he called me and he answered in a tizzy because he thought, he, I swear to God, he thought I was the plumber who was running late to come fix it because he probably like picked up the phone near the, they're like, oh, okay. And he's like, I just got done with a workout. Are you still coming over at 10? I'm like, Mr. So-and-so, it's great I got you on the phone. Uh, we're preparing a story in an hour that says you did X, Y, and Z. And, and like that's, I think, the only time that, I mean, this is not an, a, you know, do not use this for anonymous communications. I mean, it's to basically, I mean, in, in my, my experience, it's to, you know, hit them with that, the area code that they think is, is friendly fire, uh, or is it is a friendly number when it's not? So one time I bought a burner and did the sort of Alice and Bob thing you just laid out, and I sent it in the mail to my source, an executive at a company who was trying to share all sorts of damning information about his company. And we met in a cafe, and I said, I'm going to be sending you a phone. And he agreed this was not a first date problem. We had you know, been talking for years, so um, he was willing to set up this encrypted channel. And, um, and then I would call, I would text, nothing, no response, no response. So finally I had to call. I'd be like, what are you doing with the burner phone? He's like, oh, I never bring it anywhere with me. I just leave it at home. <laughs> so the never, you know, just like it didn't have enough room in his pockets, right? You have one phone. And so, you know, once again, I was like, I would end up calling to tell him to go pick up the burner phone. And so that was a pointless exercise. Yeah. And, it, and, it, and the burner thing is difficult, too. I mean, you know, particularly... <laughs> You know, the, in, in, at least in the states, I mean, the, the stereotype. You know, it's like you're, you must be a drug dealer if you're getting a burner phone with cash, and and you you really look like the. I mean, I'm a journalist by training. I don't care. I you know, I look like an odd duck for a living, and that's fine. I'm fine being the weird guy, but like when you're there, the you know the AT and T store, or whatever, you're topping up your SIM card, and you're like the guy pulling out wads of cash, <laughs> and you don't really want to give your driver's license because you don't really have to, and you're given a name that the guy knows is not your real name. And you're doing this weird dance, and it's just like, it's just like, it's like, it's like a terrible Christmas dinner. It's just like, I just want to go home. Just give me the thing and go. And, and you got to do that to fill it up. And it's, you know. So basically, we need to uh, normalize the burner phone or something. Um, do any of you use Tor? Yeah. Oh, yeah, all the time. I guess we heard um, Laura's success story with Tails. Um, I mean, I don't think any of us could do our work without Tor. I mean, I mean, really. I, yeah. I mean, I think we use it every day. And and even for for people who don't who don't understand, you know, DNS, all I do is I don't know why I use this website. I go to I I, 
I put them down, I go, you know, particularly since the, the, the AP has their own net block and, it, you know, you reverse look up that address, it says the Associated Press, you know, new, you know whatever, 33rd Street, New York, New York. And, you know, you, you, you go to ipchicken.com or whatever. I'm like, look, you know, somebody who's monitoring a government email or a government web server, it, you know, you're immediately tipping them off that you're hitting them. I mean, there's many uses for Tor besides that, but just the little things that always seems to, like, they're grasping, they're like, oh, they really know it's me. I'm like, yeah, they, they know it's you. I mean, so. Actually, Tails is like the, my favorite sort of um, success story. So with fellow journalists, actually, who don't, who find all this other encryption difficult, I find that actually showing Tails is easier because it's sort of this controlled environment. So I've had some success getting some colleagues to use Tails because it's sort of simple. The idea is a little bit simpler. The idea that you just have this separate machine that you just do this and it's sort of all, the box is built as a default to make you kind of make the right choices. And so um, it's, it's probably my favorite tool. I think that segues into sort of the last <coughs> journalist task, which is keeping notes and data. Um, and of course, from the perspective of the hapless cryptographer, this is easy. Alice wants to keep some notes. She encrypts the data to her private key. Nobody but her can decrypt it. So um, then, of course, situation number one, collaboration with fellow journalists. Um. I mean, there, there are times, I'm, I'm just thinking of in, in recent memory when we've had, I mean, the AP is a global news organization. We have people all over the world and, and you know, uh, you know, sometimes we need to, you know, communicate securely. And like I was talking about earlier, and again, this is, you know, this is no, it's not malicious that people do this, but they, you know, they're just so used to picking up the phone using, you know, plain old telephone service and just dialing, you know, 011, the number, what have you. Um, and and I, I just remember, you know, coming close once to, to being on a call where people were calling in from, like, shall I say, hostile countries toward journalists and their sources, and we were all calling in using these unsecured lines, and then we all sort of realized, like, what we were doing, and it was, you know, it's like, you know, we all sort of realized, you know, oops, we left the back door open, I think the cat just got out, and it's too late. Um, but not quite, because we didn't really, we were about to, you know, we weren't going to say, so confidential source X lives on whatever street in Venezuela, you know, we didn't get to that point. But, you know, even, even when we're sort of used to it, you know, after Snowden has sort of showed us that, and, and the AP sub subpoenas that, you know, people really want your, your data, they, 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 they will get access to it, and this is, you know, no laughing matter. I mean, um, and even, you know, people who do it all the time sometimes forget about it just by force of habit, and I, I think that's, you know, a problem. Like, obviously, we need to correct ourselves internally, but. But it's one of these things, actually, it's sort of like the mindset in journalist newsrooms is sort of, is, is outdated. So the sort of rule of thumb in a newsroom, uh, most newsrooms, would be if you're filing a story based on a confidential source, your editor, and oftentimes the editors up the chain, need to know the identity of that source. And that's a general practice. And the problem is your editor may be in another country. And so... Um, you know, in, at the Wall Street Journal where I worked for 14 years, you know, sometimes, like, it just wasn't possible for the journalist to convey to the management in New York who the source was in a secure way. And sometimes, before a story would run, that journalist would actually fly to New York to talk to the editors and say, this is the real story, um, you should publish it. And, of course, that delays publication um, and is very expensive. And so there, it's, um, it's just a challenge within the structure of newsrooms. Yeah, I mean, I certainly experienced um, this, these kinds of problems working on, on this story. Um, before, right before going to Hong Kong, the Washington Post got very nervous and there were a bunch of lawyers that were making phone calls. They were all in the clear and they were sending emails about what was going on. And I mean, I really freaked out because it seemed, I mean, this was the most risky time to, to be having these kind of communications over anything electronic. Uh, let me, actually, I want to say something about the sort of collecting of uh, notes because as a, as a <coughs> filmmaker, I mean, what I do is I, I actually usually you know, filming. And so, I mean, one of the things that I would love if somebody could someday develop is if you can record um, uh, video to an encrypted 
um, media. And so you don't have unencrypted media on you because that's pretty risky depending on what situation. If you happen to be, for instance, filming a protest and you're not able to you know, pull out an SD card in time. Uh, when I was in Hong Kong, I was, um, I was concerned that we'd be raided, and so every day I was backing up the media and putting it onto encrypted drives, but then I was, had to physically like, destroy the SD cards because I didn't want um, you know, the raw footage to ever fall in anyone else's hands. And, and it's, it happens a lot when you have people who are working in, you know, whatever, in, in protests in Egypt, for instance. Um, if, if they get your camera, they can get, potentially get a lot of information if you can't get your media out in time and do something with it. So I think we're, we're almost done here So um, with the slides, so start preparing your questions and your answers to all of us. Um, I think, uh, well, what Laura's story just um, segued into the legal coercion problem that um, one of the big threats that journalists face is um, coercion from governments, um, either forceful or legal or any other way. Does our AP representative want to talk about the problems of, that the AP has faced? Yeah, I'm, I mean, just, in, just I mean, generally speaking, I mean, I think, I, I mean, it's it's not. I mean, it is a, a little bit of a hostile time, and maybe that's understating it. I mean, for journalists, I mean, and I, and I apologize. I, I come from a very American-centric point of view because I'm a Washington journalist, but. I mean, this is, it's sort of conversely the most transparent administration in global history. But, you know, we were talking about MC catchers the other, you know, at an earlier panel. And, you know, this is the same meanwhile government that turns around and tells, you know, we, my colleague and I found out that tells local law enforcement they can't even release details about what the local police do. And, you know, it's very secretive about, you know, getting, like when they got our phone records, you know, they're, this, it's, you know, people even coming down to sources and sort of like the bottom line here where, you know, why this matters so much is it's not, the segues into it's not just, you know, about the intelligence community here. It's not about, you know, a, a, you know, an NSA contractor in Hawaii who, you know, dumps all the, you know, top secret classified documents as important as it is. I mean, these are people who work in, in state houses and in companies. I mean, as, as, as Julia was saying, you know, like a company that's crooked. And, and, you know, people lose their jobs for this. I mean, they lose their mortgages, they can't pay their bills, they can't feed their families. I mean, these are very real effects of talking to the press, just talking to us. And, and I think we owe it to sources to do a, a better job at this. I mean, we have the tools at our disposal, and with the help of the crypto community, I think we can, you know, we really do it right and make this better so we can have better journalism and hold people accountable. It's so cliche to say, but that's the reason why we do what we do. And, you know, we can't just, you know, go back to a plain text world when en encryption is, you know, clearly the next forefront. So. <laughs> and I just want to add one thing, which is that I, um, I think that newsrooms, I, I, I know that journalism is also under financial pressure, but I believe we have a moral obligation to invest more in these types of tools, right? It's heartbreaking to me whenever I learn how few people support um, the tools that I use every day and how underfunded they are. And I personally try to donate, but I, I don't have, I mean, I'm a journalist, right? I'm not, I'm not going to be able to pull this by myself, and but I think our newsrooms would be well served to see these tools as, as central to our work and to invest in them. All right, last slide before questions. Um, the last issue that a lot of you run into is crossing international borders. <laughs> <laughs> okay, wow. Um, yeah, I mean, it's 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 no man's land. I mean, in terms of legal, I mean, you have no protection, and they and they 
and they use it. I mean, the U.S. government when I say they. Um, and, uh, you know, in my case, you know, I was over six years detained every time I returned to the country and, you know, they photocopied notebooks and threatened to take electronics many times. They would stack them in a pile and then, you know, I would say that I was a journalist and we would have long fights and they would say things like, well, you know, this will go much faster for you if you just give us your passwords. And I'd say, you know, that's not happening. And then they'd say, well, if you don't answer our questions, we'll find our answers on your electronics. You know, that was one of my favorite quotes. Um, I mean, ultimately, I moved to Berlin because of this problem, um, because, of the, because of the project I was working on. I, couldn't, I didn't feel that I could protect the source material I had and cross the U.S. border. And so I started, I was shooting and um, filming, and then I would you know, leave footage outside of the country, back it up, and then return home, and did that for a while. And then once I needed to start editing, um, then I came to Berlin and, and started working there. So it really was, it you know, created a, a huge problem for, um, for me to be able to do the work in the U.S. I think there's a question that we don't know how to answer. Is it safer to bring data across a border with your person or to send it electronically? Maybe the answer is just no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think, I think to a, a trusted you know, second party would be probably the safest. There are no more stories that our other panelists want to tell. Well, I mean, I haven't um, uh, obviously left the country. I still live in New York. But I have, for the past several years, um, after one source called me and said, look, I know you're about to go on your annual trip to India. I go every year to visit my husband's family in, in India at Christmas time. And this person said, I just can't have your, my name in your contact if you're going to bring your phone across the border. And at that moment, I realized, oh, my God, I can't, I can't bring anybody's name across in my contact list. So I realized I had to leave my phone behind. And I have continued to leave my phone behind on every international trip and, um, and also my computer. I have a, what I call a zero data policy crossing borders, which, by the way, means I don't have anything, right? So it's really inconvenient to come with no data. It means that I get less work done, I'm less productive, I bring a, a tails machine and then I have a, you know, some documents I might want to work on on a stick, but um, it's not a great and convenient way to do reporting. And my editors, despite you know supporting me, are really annoyed when I don't reply to their emails. <laughs> All right, so I guess with that, we'll open up for questions and answers. From all Thank of you. you. So before we start the questions, first of all, if anybody is leaving right now, please do so very quietly, take your trash with you. And also it would be nice if you would not let any Marta bottles fall over. Thank you for the demonstration. <laughs> and. Uh, also, if, if you have free seats now, then please already try to defragment a bit, like move inwards in your respective rows and uh, make room on the sides. Okay. We will we'll not let anybody inside this room yet That's before uh, the next section, but basically the film is going to start. So during the Q&A, please try to be a bit quieter than right now. A bit quieter, please. Okay. <coughs> so then. Uh, hi. Let's start Me? with microphone one. Um, so if you're so much in the focus of uh, agencies and so on, like Laura, um, what do you do about endpoint security? Let's say you do everything correct with encryption, but now you have this air gap device laying in your home and like do you always carry it with you or do you, did, like do you sleep with it under your pillow or how do you make sure that it doesn't get bugged <laughs> I would never answer that question to be okay. so i mean would you have any advice for people uh, who want to uh, who have that problem like i mean what or, or, or how would they find out what they should do I mean, obviously, it's a question of threat model, right? You know, and um, I, 
I mean, you know, there. I mean, I don't know if Sarah Harrison is here. I know she's giving a talk, but she's off. She carries a lot of computers with her. I mean, that's sometimes what we do. There are times when you carry a lot of computers with with yeah. you, and and I think that there are times, you know, where it depends where it, that might be more necessary than others, depending on what you're working on and or the political context that, in which you're working. So. I mean, obviously, I mean, what people will say is that if you, you know, do never lose possession of it, it would, yep. it would be, you know, the, the sort of, you know, absolute secure recommendation. Thank you. Microphone two, please. Hello. Um, I was left with the impression that burner phones are a viable option for informants. I would dispute that view. Uh, so the, prob the problem I see with burner phones uh, is that in the data mining is very easy to identify a burner phone because like let's say if we have a burner phone there are two cases you travel with a burner phone then you quickly identify a burner phone as a burner phone because the movement pattern is very similar or identical you see like the same base stations so you can identify not only that uh, you can identify which person has a burner phone and because you know the identity of that person you can identify that it's that person's burner phone and even for the stationary case where we, for example, leave the burner phone at home, uh, the burner phone has a very distinct communication pattern because you essentially just communicate to one person, which is extremely unusual. So together with the locationing, you know, for example, okay, the person is living, let's say, in a radius of a kilometer or something, but you have these special phones that only talk to one person. Uh, so um, I, I don't think there is a good scenario for burner phones that well, should be avoided. I would just say that um, on burner phones, that it depends on your threat model, right? For a state actor who can see the whole cell network, you're completely right. I wouldn't recommend burner phones. But I was using a burner phone in this particular instance for a corporate source, right? And I don't think his company was going to be able to get the cell companies to give up that information. I wanted him just to not use his corporate paid cell phone, which is what he previously was using to talk to me, right? So it depends on your threat model. For some people, a burner could be fine. Okay, thanks. Thank you. So let's get a question from the internet. Can you give the, can you activate the microphone? Okay, now it's activated. Hello. Well, there are a thousand questions on the IRC channel, and I hope I can at least relay a few of them. Well, a lot of them are going about training for journalists. Like, are there any um, journalism schools or universities that are teaching crypto as an obligatory um, yeah, basic skill? or? What can a technical journalism, uh, journalist do to lure more of their fellow um, students into some crypto parties? And also, um, yeah, how many days or weeks or years uh, do a, does a journalist in your experience need to really also get the point of encryption or secure communication to be also comfortable with it. So this is all about this huge field. I, mean, I knew journalism schools up to five years ago that like their prime technological feat besides doing beat, as we would call beat reporting, was teaching people how to use Adobe Flash. And like that ticked the box with like the technology that needed to be learned. And, and, and again, maybe it's an old dog, new tricks thing, or people who are in the business and they're like, this crypto thing. I mean, those include journalism professors too, who never had to use this, never had to face this reality. Um, I know uh, Columbia University has a computational journalism track. I know there's been, I'm, I'm not the expert on this, maybe somebody else is. I know that this has been at least a discussion in like the American journalism education community about, you know, it's not just the crypto too, it's, you know, d digital public records requests and analyzing, you know, big data, you know, how to parse through it. All these sorts of things that, you know, that, that go beyond the, you know, notebook assisted reporting of days of yore, you know, and, and I, I I'm sure that's a discussion somewhere. I would um, hope so. I'm working with the Columbia Journalism School right now. Actually, I'm writing a chapter for their one of, a book that's coming out on what types of um, techniques journalists can use, and they are um, beefing up their um, crypto um, programs, but it's not mandatory. And um, the truth is that there's a lot of confusion out there about what are the best crypto tools, and there's. Um, 
One thing that's upsetting to me is that there are, you know, every day I get an email from a new crypto program, and some of them are not really as encrypted as they seem. And so I think there's a lot of confusion in the regular public about what they should use, which is why, and you guys probably already yeah, know, all, know all this, but essentially I did a ranking with EFF oh, of crypto tools on seven criteria just to provide some sort of benchmark of what people might think, might consider actually safe. Thank you. So microphone three, please. Uh, hello, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I want to raise a question about uh, a power structure that was not part of the discussion so far. I once gave a crypto party at a big uh, Dutch news corporation for the Dutch people in the room called the NOS. And the journalists were super enthusiastic. They wanted to get started right away. And I said, okay, let's get started with installing Tor. And they said, we are not allowed to do that on our machines. Uh, but luckily there were some tech people of the NOS in the room and, and we looked at them like, can you help them out? Can you give them permission? And said, uh, we could, but we're not allowed because it's not part of our budget to install this and everything's actually closed down and if we change anything it will all fall together and they looked kind of panicked. And then it turned out that management had to come in but they were nowhere to be found. And that seemed, and maybe you can relate to that, in a lot of news corporations there's this management layer that in the end needs to be like part of this whole transition into like secure communication. Yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's a really, really, really great question because um, having worked for American news companies where they are cut to the bone, um, that is a very real concern. I mean, you have almost two parts, I would say, or two sort of issues. One is the money issue, um, you know, I, because, you know, from an IT, I mean, you know, from a newsroom point of view, we're like, well, it's a great source, let's do it. It, it. You know, pay any cost, bear any burden, we're gonna do it. But then they're like, no, we only have X amount for fiscal year, whatever, and by the way, our exchange mail servers are basically smoking, you can see one smoking, that's where the money has to go right now. The other one is what to... What does it cost to install Tor? Yeah, exactly, and that, that's a, the counter argument to that is, it, it doesn't and it's not what they're used to. They're not used to doing this. And so at least the, the success that we've had, or I've had in some news organizations, others of either uh, as well, is sort of the, um, uh, a, a, a now a journal professor, Matt Waite, used to be a reporter in, in Florida, has this thing called demos, not memos, like do this organic from the bottom up and sort of show how it works, do a test case, you know, use free software, use Tor, you know, use the Tor browser and the IP chicken thing that I was taught, whatever you want to use. And then people sort of have these little epiphanies like, oh, okay, that makes sense. And then that, you know, and it's, I've seen it happen even very recently, it starts bubbling up to the top, you know, combined with the other news just in general about how, you know, the government is basically looking over our shoulder. And, you know, ideally that starts to collide. And, and you know, the, the selling point for them is like Tor, it's, or Tails, it's free, you know, cost of a DVD, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give you 10 on the house, just download it, you know, and I think it's that, it's just, it's just a different mindset that they're not used to, just like well, reporters aren't used to it. Yeah, but also, I mean, there's a problem with IT departments and newsrooms being total control freaks and not letting anyone touch any machines, and that's just not about cost or, or, you know, not understanding how it works, they're just, you know, not, don't want anyone touching any machine and they want to keep, you know, access to every machine that goes out of a newsroom and that just needs to stop. I mean, I think I was at um, Democracy Now! And, um, and, and Jake was trying to install OTR and someone's, you know, he said, oh, you should have OTRs so we can talk and he started to install it and like an IT, a freaked out IT person came into the room and was like, what are you doing to this computer? So they were, they were actually, on, they were able to know that that was happening, A, that's sort yeah. of fucked up, and, and B, yeah. why would you ever stop that? And, and, and it's funny because then people do the workarounds, right? Like I was in a news organization once where I, 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 I couldn't, it was locked down administratively, I couldn't install anything so I just brought in my home, my, 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 whatever, power book, whatever it was at the time, and I installed it, and they were so concerned about security, 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 but then I just took the ethernet cable and just bam, right into the wall, and got right under the network. I'm like, okay. So like on one end, we're concerned about security here, but on here, I can, it's no problem, okay. Thank you. Another question from the internet, please. Yeah, as I just touched the um, journalists, I now go to developers as the target group. So what tools would you need or would other um, journalists need that open source developers can um, develop and um, make better? And like, 
what features are really most important to you to help you make your job? I think that um, actually investment in GPG itself would be great because I love the fact of the public key infrastructure, the fact that you and your source don't have to um, don't have to know each other, right? Because if, if you if somebody reaches out to you the way that Snowden reached out to Laura, he there was a way, even though it's clunky, it seems to me that that method of sort of overcoming that first date problem of finding somebody and verifying them in a public way is still sort of our best hope. Those are the sources that we want to attract to us is somebody who just thinks they might want to share something. And if we could make that easier, I would be really in favor of that. That's, I still use GPG much more than I use a, any other tool, despite my constant frustrations with it. Yeah, I mean, I, I would just echo again what Julia said earlier about Tails and what, an ex, what a great um, device that is for us to do the work. Because what I found when I started doing the reporting, then it wasn't just me who needed it, but then you have a circle of people who you're also reporting with that you have to bring up to speed. And you could actually, you know, I, I ended up making a lot of Tails disks and circulating them to people so that I had people in my circle that I needed to talk to. And that was, became, you know, relatively large. And to have a tool that actually is sending things by default with encryption that, that you can just say, here's a computer, this is how you find me, um, was the most valuable tool for doing this reporting. Thank you. <coughs> so, microphone four, please. Uh, good. Uh, so I just wanted to make a couple of comments, uh, positive comments about the use of burner phones. Um, ideally, uh, both parties will have a burner phone that was bought in cash from a brand where you don't have to show ID and you don't have to deal with a human. Um, in the US, these are track phones usually, where you just go into uh, a convenience store or something like that, you buy something in cash, you buy some you know, minutes that you add onto there, uh, and that's that. Okay, so ideally, as the, the first comment actually pointed out, is that if you're carrying these around all the time, uh, the social graphing becomes very easy because you know Julia's social graph um, you know, calls she's making, where she's at, which cell tower she's hitting, will match up identically with her burner phone. And that's absolutely not what you want. Um, ideally, you would want to have a set time where you have your battery into the phone and all of the times it's off on both ends. So if you say, you know, Saturday from seven to nine every week, please put your battery in the phone. If I don't call, okay. If I do call, okay. And all of the times, just keep it unplugged. And that's a really good way to ensure that, you know, hopefully you're both making calls outside of the house. So maybe it's even slightly less um, um, trackable. But also if you're in a big city like New York, it doesn't necessarily matter. This is also what drug dealers do. You might recognize this method from there. <laughs> I'm super excited to meet the source who's going to comply with those directions. Please put your battery in this phone from 7 to 9 on Saturday. I'm sure that person is out there. <laughs> All right, um, another question from the internet, please. Yeah, following up on this, like what should a source do? What is the most sensible way to contact a journalist? And what in your experience are the typical and maybe most fatal uh, mistakes they make? That's a great question. Uh, a great question. Um, you know, a, it depends on how secure you want to be. Um, it's very difficult to make first contact without using, you know, the journalist's existing email address. So you are going to have some, <laughs> or, or some known way to reach them. I actually advise people to use the postal mail. Um, no return address, and um, I read my mail. I get it. Um, I get a lot of mail. Most of it isn't interesting, but some of it's really interesting. And then you can put a disposable email address in there or a phone number and I will reach out. Um, I think it's an underestimated tool. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah and you get, you get, I mean, I get letters all the time from not all the time, but from people who do want to make that first contact if I haven't already met them at a previous social occasion. I mean, again, this is very specific to Washington because everybody talks to everyone, but I mean, then they will send me a note and, you know, ask me to get in touch with them, I guess. 
We have time for two quick questions. So first, microphone one, please. Regarding the request for encrypted uh, video, the Magic Lantern project, which is a open source firmware for the Canon SLR uh, cameras, already supports RSA encrypting of uh, the still images, but not yet the video. Uh, but if you reach out to us, we'd be happy to talk about whether or not that's a possibility. That, that's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that was more of a comment than a question, but thank you. So, microphone three, last question, please. Yes, um, you mentioned the coercion problem, and um, thank you. Uh, so, what would you think of uh, systems which basically allow you to uh, set up a passphrase, an encryption passphrase, which uh, basically a fake one, which would uh, make your data definitely unusable? Uh, if you ever use it. Is it actually a good solution for the coercion issue? You mean that would destroy your data? Like if you get hand over or this password, it would destroy everything? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, or well, I mean, at yeah, least I mean, I the think encryption. In the, in the context of the UK, that you know, would probably be something that, because I think they can hold you if you don't, if you don't comply with that. It, it depends on the context, but I think yeah, that would, I think, be very valuable. I, I don't know yeah, if it's been done. Yeah. Would you guys use such a thing? I would love to have such a thing. I think it's fun to have the idea of the escape handle, yeah. like <laughs> stop the train, right? Um, because then also I would sort of feel maybe better about bringing my devices over the border if I could feel very confident that I could destroy it at a moment's notice. Wasn't um, Hillary Clinton advocating for like a kill switch? No, wait, what was there? There was a kill switch idea, but that was something else. Never mind. Yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure if you've already had a legal demand, that would be a uh, risk of contempt of court to use such a thing. Mm -hmm. Right. That's mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, then we're finished. Thank you very much. Give them again a warm applause. <laughs>